Hi everybody, welcome to part two of our tour of um, Londinium with Dr. Jane Sedell. Um, and uh, I'm here, I'm Kim Biddulph, I work at Billingsgate Roman House and Baths um, and the City of London Police Museum, which is a bit of a, a strange combination. Um, and we're also joined by my colleague, um, Andrew Lane. Hello, um, I work at the Guildhall Art Gallery and London's Roman Abbey Theatre at Billingsgate Roman House and Bards and the City of London Police Museum. Now there's a strange combination as well. That is, that is quite a combination. Um, and um, hopefully you've already watched the first um, section of this tour of the London Wall. Um, and now we're going to be looking inside at the highlights of Roman London. Over to you, Jane. Great, thank you very much. So I'm the Inspector of Ancient Monuments, which is also a mouthful, a fantastic one. And I want to take you on a few steps into Roman London and give you an idea of what you can go and see yourself once we all get out of lockdown um, and what people might have seen at the time. I want you to imagine then that a Roman family has come from somewhere else, another province in the empire, maybe North Africa, maybe Spain, maybe Germany, um, uh, or Greece rather. Um, and what would they see when they came into London? What might they, what might they do? Now, unfortunately, we've lost an awful lot of Roman London. The city of London has been built on now for nearly 2000 years since the Roman conquest in AD 43 and an awful lot has been destroyed but considering quite how much building there's been in London we've still got a certain amount and we're very lucky that excavations still continue in fact they're happening today uh, and we still make discoveries about Roman London um, and this happens year by year. We have an inventory from 1928 of everything that was known about Roman London then, and it was quite a lot then. But as I say, excavations are going ahead every year and we make new discoveries. We might find new buildings, new artefacts, uh, and I'll show some of those as we, as we go along. This is the recent excavation that took place by Bank Tube Station um, a couple of years ago and was one of the richest sites we've had for years with over 5,000 um, particular small finds, special artefacts found, as well as tons, literally, of pottery and brick and timber. And you can see the remains of some of the structures, uh, yards, houses, little tenement blocks uh, in front of you here. So we're very lucky that we are still able to excavate in London and make these new discoveries. This was a spectacular new discovery a couple of years ago this was a Roman sarcophagus um, or stone case for a lead coffin that was discovered in Southwark. Roman London is divided into two halves really the bit north of the river where the modern city of London is and the bit south of the river largely where Southwark is and there were rules about what could and couldn't happen inside or outside the city walls. You weren't allowed to bury people inside the city walls so outside the city walls and in places like Southwark particularly lining the major roads you would get burial grounds and cemeteries and this turned up in Southwark which really has a, a very interesting area it's like a necropolis a, a city of the dead and there are a series of strange funerary structures and burial grounds and this turned up a couple of years ago and it became the focus of a very good exhibition that the Museum of London put on called the London Dead uh, sorry the Roman Dead and if our if our visitors were coming up the road from the south towards London they might have been coming in a carriage or a cart and they would have gone through this burial ground and they would have seen um, mausolea, they would have seen statues, they would have seen all sorts of interesting carvings commemorating the ancestors because the Romans were very keen on remembering their ancestors and cults of um, ancestor worship and so this is what our visitors would have seen as they approached London if they came from the south. And in these burial grounds you get all sorts of very interesting artefacts and this is one of the Museum of London conservators conserving um, a glass funerary vessel. And these are some of the items that you would find um, contained within sarcophagi. This is a jet 
pendant with the head of um, Medusa in this case. So she's a lady with snakes in her hair and you can see them um, just here, the little snakes forming her hair. And she's the person that if you stared at her, you would turn into stone. So not a good lady to look full in the eyes. And this is a type of sculpture that you would find. This is not from Southwark, this is from what we call the Eastern London Cemetery. So in the edge of, um, just outside the city of London, and this was found abandoned in a ditch, but it almost certainly came from the cemetery area. And again, these are the sorts of things that our visitors would see as they approached the city of London, but before they got inside it. This is a reconstruction drawing of a temple. This was excavated um, in Tabard Square about 10 years ago in Southwark. And there were a pair of temples like this. And again, it's what you would see as you approach the city of London. And the city of London was very densely built up by the height of the Roman period and more space was needed for some of these temples and the areas around them, the large precincts. And I'm afraid at the base of this picture, you can see some animals that are looking slightly apprehensive because they're probably going to form part of a sacrifice. And so more space was needed for some of these Roman practices than you would find in the centre of the city of London. On the side of that temple, we get a really important inscription. And we're very lucky that we do have some written sources for Roman London. And if you see at the bottom here, this would have been Londoniensis. Uh, and this is one of the very early carvings of the word London that we see. And it was from that temple site in Tabard Square. And this would have been erected by the person that paid for the temple to be put up. And he seems to have been a trader, this word Moritex. This is um, part of a, a, a trader or a merchant's identity. Now, how did you get from Southwark to Londinium itself? We think the bridge that crossed from the area of London Bridge now, almost exactly the same location as the current London Bridge. We think it was a timber structure, not quite like this, probably slightly more robust. This is a reconstruction of probably an early river crossing that the Roman army used. And as we got to the permanent bridge, we think timber again, rather than brick or stone, but perhaps a little bit more robust than this. But this is the sort of thing. And then this is a model of the bridge and the waterfront. And when the Museum of London finally reopens, it has a series of these models, which are a really good way of showing how London would have looked and how it would have been populated that we can't see on the streets now, because we find traces of this. We find these things, there's my cursor. We find these sort of timber pieces here. And we'll find the foundations of these warehouses and we find these waterfronts. But it's very difficult to convey the full three dimensionality of Roman London and things like these models uh, are a really good way of showing it. So our family um, would potentially have come in their cart or their carriage or possibly on horseback or even walked. There's a little sedan chair here and they'd have come across the bridge into the bustling port area because London was well known for its trade across the empire. Um, and there would have been vessels like this lining the waterfront. This is an example of the Roman waterfront. This was found um, very close to London Bridge. Um, this is uh, about 20 years ago now, actually. Gosh, I worked on this site. Um, and this shows the, the scale of the construction. The waterfront was very large, very robust, and it needed to be because it had a series of warehouses just behind it, and it had boats offloading and taking goods on all the time. And we even have tiny traces of the boats themselves. This is um, in the square here. This is a little test pit five meters below the road surface over in Guy's Hospital in Southwark. Um, and this is the remains of 
um, a boat that would be used to ferry goods from the larger seagoing ships to the, um, the waterfronts in Southwark, which had a slightly different port arrangement. And this boat is actually one of my scheduled monuments that I look after, but we had a little look at it a few years ago to make sure it was there and well preserved and wouldn't be harmed by a new building going up. So we have traces of the waterfront, we have traces of the bridge and we have traces of the boats themselves. This is how London looked at its height. You see the bridge there crossing the river and there's a series of structures and buildings um, that we're going to take a little look at. But much of London you can see had quite a dense street grid and then there would have been a series of houses and a series of shops, a series of bars, cafes, temples, fairly packed in. We don't think that the whole area of London was completely densely packed in and so some of these areas close to the edges of the walls might have been market gardens um, and relatively unused spaces but in the middle amazingly dense and so our visitors were coming up from the south through this necropolis area our little boat is over here come over the bridges I've shown you'd seen the waterfront and then what would they have done next there's a whole series of things that they could have done once they got into Londinium Central that was surrounded by walls um, and probably after a long journey from Spain or North Africa that could have taken several weeks and um, might have involved quite a nasty crossing of the channel um, they probably want to collapse in maybe a, a, a friend's house. Potentially they would have been coming to visit friends working for effectively the civil service or they may have had friends in the military and so they'd have probably wanted to go to where they were staying and this is a reconstruction of quite a nice Roman house, quite a well-to-do Roman house and we know that because it has this very nice decorative scheme on the walls but this mosaic and this is a real Roman mosaic that was found in London quite close to Bank Tube Station. Oh this was found in I can't remember the exact date. Kim Andrew can you remember this is the Bucklersbury mosaic was it 18, uh, 1880s something like that 1860s? This is unfair to <laughs> unfair to throw this at you without checking first I should have checked myself um, but it, I think it's the I think it's the 1860s actually I think it's a little bit after the remains were found in Greenwich because um, there's a great drawing from the Illustrated London News <laughs> but this again this this can be found in the Museum of London and it's a nice example of of where a Roman family visiting London might have stayed and the kind of comforts that they'd have expected. So these remains are this table, these chairs, the sofa, they're all based on excavated examples from places like Pompeii. Um, but the mosaic itself is the real thing that was lifted from the excavation quite close to Bank in the 19th century. Once they've um, dropped their bags and gone to where they're staying, they might have wanted a bath. Um, they must have been hot and grubby and a number of Roman houses would have had their own baths but on the whole people went to the public baths, quite large um, bath houses that a number of people would have gone to at the same point and these were largely saunas, you didn't get into communal baths with strangers, um, in the main saunas or, or steam houses and oops, sorry this one is at Huggin Hill and this is protected below ground but it's not visible whereas this one at Billingsgate um, is visible and perhaps Kim would like to say a little bit more about that as she does look after it. Oh well we and Andrew um, yeah I mean obviously the Billingsgate one is a private bathhouse it's attached to a um, uh, a private house we think unless it was turned into a small um, hotel type thing a mancio um, so it only has two heated rooms and then a cold room as well whereas the big public baths were had lots of different rooms in which you would do various different things um, yeah so here we have a little seat in the tepidarium which I think um, you find out more about in the first video that we did um, about Billingsgate which was the introduction to the site and amazingly well preserved as well. 
it must be said that this is probably the best Roman structure that you'll see in London in terms of its preservation is absolutely fantastic and it's something that everyone can really really understand so it's a lovely site and we'll all look forward to welcoming you when we all get back um, to opening these sites. In the meantime again we still find um, evidence this is a shot of the Huggin Hill bathhouse uh, and there are works going on there actually at, at the moment. Um, the remains are being carefully protected when we find them. Some we knew about and some are new like this one uh, and there was actually some quite nice painted wall plaster here as well so it's good to see that again we continue to make new discoveries um, through the planning process in this case. So I was pleased that we found a bit more of the baths at Huggin Hill. And the drains. I love showing this photo because this um, this is actually quite close to monument. But uh, in the in the famous Monty Python phrase, "What did the Romans ever do for us?" My goodness, they introduce hygiene and drainage and sewers and movement of water like there's no tomorrow. And you see how beautifully constructed this is. I realise not everyone is into drainage, but this is a great example of just how comprehensively Roman London was developed. Um, and how strong a series of infrastructure was put in below ground as well as above ground. Because when you've got hundreds of people going to one bathhouse a day, there is a certain amount of um, dirty water that needs to get rid of. Uh, and if you think about how many people might be going to the loo every day as well, then again, a huge amount of water that needs to be got rid of. Okay, so our family have um, dropped the bags off at the wherever it is they're staying. They've had a bath to get clean uh, and I'm afraid now they want to hit the forum. The forum was the, the centre of the city really. You have the forum and the basilica and the two come together and this is largely where the law courts are, where the banks are and it's where the markets are. There's a lot of shops here, there's a lot of traders um, and it really is the very centre and if you walk straight up straight to the north from London Bridge. This is where you would end up. Now again this is a model that can be seen in the Museum of London and it's a massive part. It takes up quite a large part of Roman London and unfortunately practically nothing survives now at all that's visible. We think that more will survive below the streets and this is in the eastern half of the city of London but unfortunately we do know that quite a lot got destroyed and this is the only bit and it really is tiny it's the size of my desk this is the only bit that you can actually see at the moment um, and it's open on selected occasions like open house open city in London and sometimes for the festival of British archaeology sadly not at the moment because it is it's in the basement of this hairdressers in Leadenhall market so actually where this sign is here just directly beneath that, beneath the pavement, is where this little piece of the forum survives. But it does survive um, and you can get in and see it occasionally. But unfortunately, the bulk of um, what we know of the forum is, is from remains that didn't survive the very extensive development of the City of London in the Victorian period. Now, we've wondered who our family might have been coming to visit. The wall that you see in front of you here, this is underneath Cannon Street Railway Station and it's from a structure that we call the Roman Governor's Palace. London became the capital of the province of Britannia and so it's where the governor who looked after the entire province is where he resided and there's a very large building complex under Cannon Street Railway Station of at least 60 rooms, all of, all of one building. And there's some argument about this. We're not certain it's where the government um, of the country, the province was run from, but certainly it's an extremely important building. It's not the forum, we know that. And so it's got to be something of kind of equal, equal size. And so it may be that our family were perhaps taking up a job with the governor or they might have been visiting family who worked for the governor because there would have been a large group of civil servants that worked to run the province of Britannia. Um, and here again is another piece from that, from that building. This is a slightly quirky thing. London is full of strange bollards and plaques and things. 
And this is the London stone. Um, and it's a piece of oolitic limestone. And it has later myths and legends, which I won't refer to now because that would take up all my time. But it is thought likely that the tiny thing that you see in the glass case is actually the remains of a Roman column from the governor's palace that was on the other side of the road. Now, the London Stone has moved and the road, which is Cannon Street, has moved around a little bit over its 2000 year history. But it is possible that the London Stone is part of the Roman governor's palace. So if you're walking past, then, then go and have a little look and say hello. It has its own Twitter account and it does like to be talked to occasionally. So, so do drop by. So we've gone and paid our respects to our family or we've taken up our job with the, the civil service. Uh, I'm afraid uh, we might be looking for a bit of entertainment now. And underneath this lovely building, the Guildhall Art Gallery, where Kim and Andrew hang out, we have the Roman Amphitheatre. And I'm afraid to say that I'm reaching such ancient levels myself that I worked on this myself as a, as a young archaeologist for the Museum of London. And it was one of the greatest projects I've been on because we have the remains of the Roman Amphitheatre. And again, it, this would be... Um, We've gone from the centre of shopping to the centre of administration, and this is the centre of fun. This is where there would have been gladiatorial combat. It's where actually the army would have done some of their training. Um, and it's also, I'm sad to say, where bear baiting and other animal displays and um, fights would have taken place. But different times, uh, the remains have survived extremely well uh, and they're on display. And perhaps, Andrew, you might want to say a, a few words about this. Yeah, um, fabulous thing to see. Um, there is another talk um, which I've given in this series, which talks about the, the Roman amphitheatre. Um, and I think, again, it just shows that new discoveries are being made in Roman London because this is quite a recent discovery because it's 1988. So the history of Roman London is being updated the whole time, which makes it a really interesting subject for me. The very entertaining thing about the amphitheatre is everyone had known that there must be an amphitheatre somewhere, but no one had been able to work out where it was in Roman London. And when it turned up, people discovered that the modern streets around where it was buried were curved to reflect the shape of it. And so everyone sort of hit their heads afterwards saying, oh, we should have realised, but they never did. This is a, a new drawing that's being commissioned at the moment on Roman London. Uh, and this shows the position of the amphitheatre that you can see in the centre here. And it shows the position of the forum over here. We think the governor's palace would have been over here, but it's been left a bit vague because we're not sure. You see the bridge. And then in front of us here is the, the, the Roman fort. Now, this wasn't a legionary fort. The province was conquered by four Roman legions, but with an awful lot of auxiliary troops. And they would have been based here. And also the governor of the province who lived down here, his honour guard would have been here as well. And we do have a fair few traces of the fort. It was found by Professor Grimes and really understood by Professor Grimes in the 1950s, but more pieces have popped up since. And we do have a few that, that you can see today. This is a stretch that I talked about when I was talking about um, Roman London Wall in an earlier talk in this series. And this is just a nice example because you see the curved wall here. Roman Almost everything Roman was straight and orderly, except their forts. Their forts were like modern playing cards. So longer than they were wide and with curved corners. And this you can see from the street. This is at Noble Street, quite close to St Paul's Tube Station, slightly to the north of St Paul's Cathedral. And this is nicely laid out with some interpretation panels. And you see, as well as the curved wall, you have the foundations, well, the lower courses of an internal tower. And the soldiers would have climbed up ladders or a staircase inside to get up to the, the parapet. And then these are the traces of the gate into the fort from the west. Um, and they survive in part of the car park uh, at London Wall and very close to the Museum of London. And sometimes this is open for tours. And again, 
um, I mentioned this in the, the earlier talk, we were conserving this um, before lockdown started. So this will be looking um, much more spruced up. If you've seen it before, then do go back and visit it again. I love that you that Henry the Hoover is um, a Henry's really useful fantastic. technical tool. <laughs> Hen Henry turns up in so many pieces of conservation. He really is a conservation professional. Okay, so we've um, we've dropped in at the amphitheatre for a bit of gladiators, and we've possibly um, seen some of the soldiers from the fort. Then we have um, perhaps the the gentleman in the family, because men only were allowed to go to this particular temple. The picture that we're seeing is the deity Mithras, who is uh, associated with light. He comes from the east um, and is something that soldiers in particular followed. And he's associated with rebirth and light, as I say. And this shows him slaughtering um, a bull. This was found also in the 19th century, quite close to Bank Station. And this is known as a tauroctony from Taurus the bull. Um, and oh dear, this is not a very good picture. I'll move on. Not a very good picture either. But this Roman temple was found again by Professor Grimes in 1954. And it caused huge interest at the time. Lots of people, and you see how beautifully dressed they are. Lots of people came to visit the site. And then in fact, queued up, 30,000 people queued up to see this site. And the Roman religion was, was very complicated. There were any number of deities that people would worship and make sacrifice to or try and do deals with. People would bring offerings in exchange for, I want to get well, I want to do well in business, um, I want to go back to Rome, um, uh, I want to be healed. Um, but this temple is a very different cult. This is, this is all about men and getting drunk and business. And um, there were seven levels of initiation. And depending on which level you came in at, you would then have to work your way through this before you perhaps eventually might become the high priest. And so uh, our, our visiting man might have gone here to make new business connections um, and to meet people in Roman London. And it's a fantastic site. The, the preservation of the structure itself is amazing. But the finds that were made on the site, you're seeing actually the head of Serapis lying in front of us. The statues and the sculptures that turned up from this site in 1954 were quite amazing. And this again is a reconstruction. Um, now, the cult of Mithras was something that really took place in caves. But we don't have many caves in Britain at all. Um, and so the, the temples were made to kind of resemble caves. They were partly subterranean. So you see here the structure above ground with the little apse where the altar might have been here. But it's recently been rebuilt. This is known as the Walbrook Mithraeum. It's a reconstruction. It has been rebuilt because the site has a very checkered history. And this might be something that we could do uh, another talk about because the history of its discovery and it being moved and then being moved again is really, really interesting. And the cult itself is interesting. But this is something at the moment it's closed because of lockdown. But when this reopens, it's something that you can go and see. You can see some of the finds and you can see the structure uh, and you can see a sound and light show, which gives you an impression of what it would have been like to visit at the time. And I'm very pleased to say that they do let women in now. And I've been a number of times and I'm sure Kim has been too. But another thing that's really quite important if you get to visit the Warbrook Mithraeum, and this is in the Bloomberg headquarters, again, very close to Bank Tube Station. There is a, a display of 600 artifacts um, upstairs at the Mithraeum and I've shown a picture of it here because I really I really like this because it doesn't just show the fancy things it doesn't just show the jewelry it shows a lot of pottery and it shows a lot of nails and it shows some some ordinary kitchen knives here and it shows how the ordinary Roman Londoners would have lived these would have been people that come across the empire like our family they have perhaps come to take up a job or visit relatives posted out here uh, and this display shows just how people what the pots would have been on their table you know this this mug I have is not very dissimilar actually 
to the little pots that we have up here. Um, people would not have been drinking tea. Uh, they might have been drinking wine. I am not drinking wine now. But we have these great similarities. We can, we can understand and appreciate the lives of Roman Londoners. Even though we're 2,000 years on nearly, there are great similarities. So I do urge you, if you can, do go and visit the Mithraeum because you'll get a good idea of how Londoners lived. And one of the amazing discoveries that were made on the site that was excavated here um, were a series of writing tablets. So we have written words left by Londoners. Sometimes they scratched into wax, sometimes they wrote in ink. And there's an example here of these tablets. They are hard to decipher, but I'm pleased to say that there are people that specialize in this. And this one, I'm afraid it's not a brilliant picture, but you can see this. This is our first written evidence of the word London. Um, I'm pointing at the screen. So you see L-O-N-D-I-N-I, -I, probably a U for Londinium. It might be Londinio um, because the way it was uh, as pronounced uh, would vary and the way it was written would vary. This dates from maybe um, between AD 50 and AD 80, so not quite 2000 years old, but very nearly. Uh, and this was found on this, this project. And I find this um, actually surprisingly moving. You know, I'm, a, I'm an archeologist of, um, oh dear, 30 years standing. Um, and I'm still really moved by finds like this. It's a tiny piece of wood and it's just got a word scratched into it, but it's the first evidence we have for Roman London. So it's a fabulous thing. And I, I really do commend this site to you and the Museum of London, which will give you a, a great connection to Roman Londoners. And it's the people, it's the people that make this interesting. Who were they? Why were they coming to visit London? Um, what did they make of London and what did they bring to London that we can understand our history better from? So I'll end the story there uh, and hope that's given you a good idea of the sorts of things that you can go and visit to learn more about Roman London. Thank you so much, Jane. That was a really amazing tour of, of Roman London. Um, the, um, some of the sites that you've mentioned that you have to kind of uh, book on to go in or or that are indoors like the amphitheatre and the Mithraeum and Billingsgate they're obviously they're going to be reopening at different times um, so um, always have a look at, at um, online for any information um, we're always working on on those reopening we know our friends at the Mithraeum are working on their reopening plans at the moment um, and maybe you could, wait we'll tell we'll tell them about about your possible talk Jane about the the discovery and move and re uh, creation and then movement and of the of the temple of Mithras because that it is really fascinating how it's it's not quite in the right place now but it's not very far off um it's, it's a lot nearer than it was yeah <laughs> and in a much better situation being underground instead of up out in the open air um and I'm just, just going to say, I, I think the, the Mithraeum as well is wonderful because you do have the finds with it. So you have part of the remains, but you have those wonderful selection of finds. And I think, yeah, I, I'm always amazed with looking at the display case there. There's things that I think that's not so very different to what I've got at home. And my personal favourite is they've got the bottom part of a panelled door. Yeah. Um, and it's wooden and it's Roman and it looks very similar to sort of a panelled door that I've got here. And I always think that's my favourite piece. Amazing. I like the little wooden um, sandals. They look like flip flops, but they're kind of a cross between clogs and flip flops. And I really love both. Um, I would just had one question before we finish um, about the um, the street plan of the city at the moment. Um, how much of that is actually uh, similar to the Roman street plan? Quite a lot of it will be. Um, Cannon Street is very clearly the Roman road and Upper Thames Street is largely following the line of the Riverside Wall. Cheapside going through the city uh, is also very much the Roman street and Poultry uh, Bank, where a whole series of roads to spur off, also seems to follow the Roman city. In the medieval period, all sorts of smaller streets and alleyways have been put in 
because property boundaries seem to have got smaller and smaller and smaller, particularly near the river. But certainly if you're walking some streets in the city now, you are walking in the footsteps of the Romans who built those streets and then then used them. So no, and, and, all, and it's why we should have spotted the amphitheatre just from looking at maps because you suddenly see a great big curved area. <laughs> and we know that Romans very rarely go in for curved lines. So we should have spotted that. And it was it was one of those very enlightening moments where you suddenly think, oh, right. And it's why research into these things like the street grid is really useful for predicting what you might find below ground mm. and actually even if the amphitheater is not open at the moment um, or in the first phase of reopening um, you can go to Guildhall Yard can't you Andrew? Yeah no so you can get some idea of the scale of the Roman amphitheater from the yard where they've marked out where they think the wall of the arena would have gone so the arena being where all the action happens and you'll be able to see that yeah it takes up most of the yard so the whole of the amphitheater it would have been enormous it would have been one of the largest public buildings in Roman London so there's still a little bit to see. Yeah out in the open air at the moment. I believe someone has calculated how many people you might get into the arena based on the width of people's bottoms. <laughs> um, it's really interesting because, yeah, um, initially when the amphitheatre first opened, we thought that perhaps the capacity would be about six or seven thousand. And then someone else has come along at a later date and they've done some more research and they've decided that actually they're going to sit their Romans a little bit closer together. So sitting your Romans closer together means that you can up the capacity figures. So now we think between seven and ten and a half thousand. So a substantial part of Roman London's population. Yeah, because it's thought that at its height it might have had about thirty thousand people living there. Is that is that the right that's <laughs> the right I've number? Heard. Yeah, yeah that's, that's what, that's what I've come across. Yeah. So you know nearly a third of the population could have gone to the games, which is amazing really. But when you think that some of that population would be slaves and some uh, would be the soldiers and so on, then you kind of get a sense of um what what people would be allowed to do well we're com coming to the end um thank you so much jane if you have just watched this video about the interior of london uh, londinium um do go back and watch the first video that jane did for us which was about the roman london wall um which is a tour of all of the surviving bits which is fantastic um and if you've got any questions for us then you can contact us on twitter at uh, ldn roman baths or find us on facebook at billingsgate roman house and baths or if you want to email us you'll find the email address on our webpage cityoflondon.gov.uk forward slash bathhouse okay thank you Bye. thank you Bye.